Welcome to iGEM Talk Show! Grab a coffee, take a seat! For the next half an hour, we will hear a tale about science, synthetic biology and a bunch of other crazy stuff. Our guest tonight is Ronit Langer, Phoenix Project Manager at iGEM Foundation, and we will talk about Geneva, biology as a first language, and the iteration step in the engineering process. Not exactly in that order. Check it out! So uh, yeah, in my applications to college, I wrote actually something along the lines of my first language was biology. You're going to go off and you're going to talk at the UN and you're going to do all these things and it's going to be incredible, but don't forget about the little guy. Really make it so that the technologies that you're building and the type of future you're creating, you're thinking about everyone as you do that. Welcome, Roni. Welcome to the iGEM Talk Show. It's a pleasure to have you here. We have a lot of different stuff to talk about today. I know that you have a very unique uh, pathway and you have some very inspiring stories to share. So thank you for joining us today. Thanks so much for having me. I'm really excited. Yay. So let's, let's start uh, going back on time a little bit and talking about little Roni. If you were Brazilian, you would be Ronizinha or Ronitinha. I don't know. <laughs> so let's go back, talk a little bit about your child. How was your child? Where, where, where were you born? How was, um, how did you start to develop interest in, in science and other crazy things that you do nowadays? Yeah, so I was born in Manhattan, in New York City. Um, and I was born while my mom was getting her PhD in biology. So I think I was born in like the second year of her PhD and then my younger sister was born in her sixth year of her PhD. Um, so definitely spent my whole childhood with my mom as an incredible influence when it came um, to science and seeing her, you know, have a family and then also be able to do, th do something like get a PhD and work at super cool startups and then go on to run her own lab at a company and all those different things really I think you know inspired my journey from the get-go. One of like my earliest memories um, is sitting with my mom and building little DNA out of Lego um, and she was always and we were always doing like kitchen experiments and everything like that and she was always making sure that you know, anytime we asked any question, she would give us like the most accurate scientific answer. So uh, yeah, in my applications to college, I wrote actually something along the lines of my first language was biology. And I remember also going in, you know, she was working in a lab. And so I would go in and she would make, she would take like um, gloves and she would like blow them up and make them into balloons. And I would like you know, draw them like into little turkeys and she would let me like pipette water. Um, so <laughs> yeah, so definitely biology has been a big part of my life from very a very early age. But then you, your degree is not in biology, right? You, you, you studied electrical engineering and computer science. Why did you choose these? That's an excellent question. Um, and I think something that I've had to continuously justify ever since I made that decision. But not to spoil too much in terms of where the story is going, but a lot of that actually had to do with my iGEM experience. But base, the, the basic answer is that after, you know, spending a lot of time in and around biology in high school and then in my first year of, of college, what I recognized about biology was that you know, one of the amazing things that was happening in biology was that, you know, we had all this data and we had, you know, there were so many things that needed to be done with that data. And, you know, given, you know, the environment I grew up in and everything like that, I felt very confident in my ability to, you know, learn the biology as I went. But computer science was something that I had never really had any experience with and knew that it was a skill that I 
really needed to hone in to be, you know, the most effective. That's that's super interesting. So you, you mentioned iGEM. How was your like? How did you um, heard about iGEM the first time? How was your first iGEM experience? How did this happen? How you joined this crazy iGEM world? It's so crazy to think about now. It was so like serendipitous, and it was so like barely on my radar, you know, and it's just crazy to think now how big a part of my life it is. But basically what happened was I, so I, I was at MIT and I had, you know, my first year I was like, everyone does research. And I was like, I have to get a research position. Like I have to. And then I, so I spent so much time. They have like this web page where like, professors post different research opportunities that they have. So I would spend like hours like looking through it. And I was like, I'm a freshman. I have no skills. Like I don't really want to just sit and like dissect mouse brains all summer. Like I need something. So, and then iGEM was just on that website. It was just like one of the listings and it looked really intriguing and you didn't need any experience to do it. And it was an, you know, I had actually never heard of synthetic biology before iGEM, but it seemed like it was in the right direction of the types of interest that I was having, which is how are we going to take things like computer science, like biology, and make them actually useful. That's that's very cool. And then you participated in iGEM, and I know that you were part of the delegate program, the after iGEM delegate program. How did this happen? Uh, how did you hear about this? How was this experience? Because you were quite young during this, right? It was crazy because I came back from the Jamboree, and that whole semester leading up to the Jamboree, I told my friends, I was like, look, I am in the lab 24 hours a day, but don't worry when when this competition thing is all over trust me i'll be back it'll be great we'll have a great time and then i get back from the jamboree and i'm exhausted and i like can't talk to anyone because no one you know who i was living with at the time understood the experience that i had just gone through and i locked myself in a room for three days to work on my application for the delegates program and I remember when I finally submitted the application and came out, my friends were like, you're such a liar. Like, what, what is it going to be now? So then <laughs> what you also have to realize was that the Jamboree was like at the end of October and the delegates program went the first week in December. So I, the week after I submitted my application, I got called in for an interview and I was very, very privileged that I was living in you know, Boston at the time. So I got to go in to the iGEM HQ office um, and actually have an interview in person, which was excellent. And I got to like meet everybody on iGEM staff, which to me at the time, you know, now they're my friends, but at the time it was like, whoa, these people, like they just put on this crazy event that I loved so much. Like, and here they are real people. So that was a really fun experience. And, you know, the whole thing was a really quick turnaround. So within, you know, two weeks or so, um, I had submitted the application, gone for an interview. And I was actually, I remember I was at home Thanksgiving weekend. Um, and I was like waiting to hear back. And it was like, if I got it, then I had like two weeks to like turn around and get on a plane and get to Switzerland. Um, and so it was, so that weekend when I went home for Thanksgiving, actually, unfortunately, my grandfather was very sick. Um, and I like went to go visit him and I was telling him, I like found out like while I was with him that I got this opportunity and I was telling him about it. And he said to me at the time, and, and this really stuck with me is he was like, you know, you're going to go off and you're going to talk at the UN and you're going to do all these things and it's going to be incredible, but don't forget about the little guy. And what he meant by that was, you know, my grandfather, you know, experienced the entire um, 20th century and kind of all of the different technological changes that came along with that. And he really saw his generation get 
kind of left behind a little bit in this most recent techn technological revolution. And he was like, don't let your generation replicate that mistake. Really make it so that the technologies that you're building and the type of future you're creating, you're thinking about everyone as you do that. First, what was the event that you attended? Can, can you tell us a little bit more about the event itself? And how was your experience there? Yeah, so the event that I attended was the Biological Weapons Convention, specifically their meeting of the state's party. Every year, they have the meeting of the state's parties where all of the different ambassadors and delegates get together um, and discuss, you know, whatever issues have been coming up, if there's any, you know, grievances that people want to air, um, if there's any new kind of emerging issues on their horizons, you know, just generally like ambassadors talking about high level diplomatic things. And how, how was your experience there? Because you, you, you were talking that you were flying over the ocean and then you, you just arrived on time. How was being there and talking with people outside your our world of synthetic biology because you you are talking with uh, politicians right actually i don't know who attend this event yeah so this it was just the contrast between being at the jamboree only four weeks before and coming to this meeting of the states parties was crazy so just from the get-go this this week you know, I look back on it now and it's one of the most empowering weeks of my life, but also one of the most terrifying. And just to <laughs> unpack that a little bit. So we get to this, we get to this meeting and everyone's sitting, you know, get to the League of Nations building and the UN buildings and we see all the flags and we're walking up and, you know, there's clearly, there's, you know, a lot of importance and history and everything. And we go and we sit in this room where, you know, there's the round, it's kind of a round shaped room. And then they do a day and a half of introductions. And <laughs> you go to, you go to the jamboree, slides, you know, people, it's super dynamic. People are like wanting to convince you of their ideas, diplomatic meetings, it's representatives reading official statements from documents. On that first day during the break, there was like a morning session and an afternoon session. And during the break, we gave um, a presentation, like it was, it's called a side event. Um, and so we presented to whoever from the conference wanted to come and listen. And it, it was great. We actually did get, you know, quite a bit of part participants from the meeting coming and listening to us. I actually got the chance to speak about, you know, that conversation that I had with my grandfather and kind of everything that I had learned from kind of how we, how we as scientists kind of live between, you know, the world of our science, but then the world of everybody else and kind of how it's our responsibility to, to translate um, between those two. And I, I remember afterwards, you know, ambassadors approaching me and being like, that was, that was a really powerful message, especially to like a room of people who are not scientists, right? After this experience, and I, I can see how powerful it is, like, um, and both for you and the people listening directly from the IGEM community, like this is IGEM, this is synthetic biology, th this is happening. Uh, I can see the impact of this in the, in the delegates as well, and on you, in your career and your your pathway, because it, it, it's, of course, very challenging, but um, a, an amazing experience to, to have something like this at a young age and see how the world works and influence the world. It's, it's extremely powerful. Uh, and after that, you became an ambassador in iGEM. And then after being an ambassador for a year, you became, uh, you coordinate the program. So how was, how was this experience of being part of this global team of ambassadors and later on coordinating it? Uh, is there any relationship? I definitely was looking for ways to stay involved in iGEM, to give back to iGEM. And meanwhile, exact almost a year after I went to um, Geneva the first time, I actually got invited back to Geneva by the Geneva Disarmament Platform. So basically they were, the security general was relaunching a disarmament um, 
you know, agenda that, you know, wanted to put disarmament conversations kind of back on everybody's radar. Um, and one of the big pillars of this was, was youth and disarmament and how we engage youth in these conversations and bring their voices to the forefront. Um, and it was great. So I got a call and they were like, you know, you're a young person who went to a disarmament conference. Um, can you come and tell us what the youth think about disarmament? And I was like, what the youth think? The entire youth? Sure. Like, <laughs> why not? Um, so, um, yeah, flew, flew back to Geneva. <laughs> it was like the first week of my next, I was starting my junior year of college. So it was like my first week of junior year, I like had to email all of my professors and be like, I promise I'm in your class. I'm just not going to be here for the next like week. Bye. I'm going to, <laughs> to the UN. Um, and I, but I took, I took that responsibility very seriously. Um, and I really took a chance to reflect on like, what, what do young people nowadays think about disarmament and the there were you know lots of different pieces floating around in, in my mind but the thing that kind of stuck out the most and I think the thing that I centered my talk around was that you know our our generation the youth is incredibly like entrepreneurial and also incredibly like motivated and wants to like make things better and wants to like go 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 like we feel this you know almost this sense of like impending doom and we want to work on everything in our power to kind of stop things, you know, like climate change and like other really, really big problems that are, you know, we see, we're like, we're going to inherit those problems. Those are going to be our problems. So what can we do now um, to really prepare for that? And then afterwards, someone approached me and was like, you know, this was great, clearly like, you're a young person who's involved in this, but we but we can't bring everyone to Geneva, right? We can't just have all these people have the exact same experience you have to understand kind of the importance of it. So like, how do we do that? And I was like, you're right. What an excellent point. So then came back from that experience and around that time is when they were advertising for the ambassador program. And I signed up for the ambassador program, again, for two reasons. One, because I really wanted to get back to IGEM because now I've had two incredible experiences that shaped my career and my worldview and, and everything. And I wanted to kind of, through my ambassador role, be able to create some kind of event for iGEMers that would do exactly what this person in, in Geneva told me to do, which is, bring these conversations to people because you can't always bring people to these conversations. And so what I was able to do in that first year of being ambassador, besides, you know, find and interview and be inspired by, you know, a ton of North American iGEM alumni, um, was also the opportunity to put together a biosecurity policy conference which we ran the day after the 2019 Jamboree. So that was November of 2019. And I remember the, the structure of the event was basically, we're gonna bring a bunch of experts in this topic and we're gonna have them come and pair up with um, the students and the participants and everyone, the young people who were able to come to the event. and world the, together they're going to work through some type of scenario um like a bio you know threat scenario and then in the afternoon have the experts kind of share about their experiences and their careers and more of like a traditional kind of conference style and i remember in the weeks leading up to the conference as i was putting together this scenario and i was like meeting with the experts who were coming on a regular basis to try and get their input. And we spoke about how we were like, we can't have anything like that. Like we can't do a human pathogen. Like that would be too crazy. People just like couldn't, you know, they couldn't necessarily wrap their heads around kind of what that would entail. Um, and all of these things we were like, we have to just kind of like 
start off slow. <laughs> um, so we ended up doing like a mouse pathogen and the prompt was basically like, you find mice that are infected with an engineered strain of this virus and that spreads pretty rapidly. And, you know, you're the director of the CDC, like, what, what do you do? And you had to kind of come up with like, how, how do you address it? Like, what do you tell the like farmers? How do you address it publicly? Like, what do you tell the media and everything like that? And kind of come up with a whole plan of action. And it was crazy because in two hours, these, um, you know, these groups of students and experts came up with now a concept that is super familiar to us, which is test, trace, and isolate, you know, and came up with all of these different kind of ways of tackling uh, of an outbreak that, you know, then many months, not even that many months later, we were like dealing with on this global scale and no one seemed to be able to, to implement the basics that, you know, some students were able to come up with in a, in a couple of hours. I participated in the event, like uh, I was a participant, and it, it was super interesting to to talk with uh, experts from different regions, like learn about the regulations that are in different parts of the world, and just look at like a very distant scenario. And I remember talking with you afterwards, like this was super cool, super interesting. Uh, I'd like to implement something similar in in my my local place, like in in Brazil, uh, and it should be interesting. And then I, I in the beginning of last year. I, or of 2020, um, I started to think about this and how I would arrange that. And then something started to, hap to happen. I was like, hmm, maybe I should stop this a little bit and wait and see what happens with the world. And then like the, the scenario that I was thinking about implementing uh, f for a room to role play, it was the world. So <laughs> it was very interesting. Um, but it, I, I mean, it, it's, it's very powerful to be um directly interacting with the people that work on these that are experts on this connecting back to the ambassador program and why i was so excited about you know engaging with the ambassador program is that that really has become one of my fundamental beliefs is that you know if you get a group of of young people together they one they can solve all sorts of problems you throw at them and i think igem just proves that um, year after year after year. And also that, you know, our collective voice is, is, is really powerful in a way that sometimes we don't always know as individuals. And it's hard to, you know, get your, you know, I was privileged to get my individual voice kind of out there. And before we talk about what you are doing nowadays in iGEM, uh, you, you had other two uh, experiences that I, at least on my point of view, very related to what you were just talking about. So you worked with uh, biotech and cyber policy, cyber security policy, which is very interesting because it combines your biology side, your com uh, computer science side and your policy making side. H how was this experience? I got this email about this fellowship and they were specifically looking for people who had had, you know, hands on experience with policy and with kind of creating policy type events. And I'm like, here I am building this policy event and I like had all these experiences. And so like while in the like last weeks of like the final push before the event, I spent, I took, pulled like an all nighter and filled out this application <laughs> for this fellowship. Um, and then like two weeks after the conference was over when I was finally like, I can breathe a little bit. They were like, oh, and you have to come to DC for an interview in the middle of finals week. And so like I ended up having to push off my like last final of under. So it was also my last semester of, of my undergrad. Um, and so they're like, come to DC. And I had to like push off my finals and everything was, it was so crazy. So I got this, this fellowship, it's called the Scoville Fellowship. Um, and Sco the Scoville Fellowship originally started as a fellowship to bring um, young people interested in new, the topic of nuclear security down to DC and place them in these really, you know, fantastic organizations. And they would pay, Scoville pays their salary. And so they're like basically like 
free pre-vetted labor for, for these for these um, think tanks and other advocacy institutions. And so, you know, since you're not on their payroll, like they can kind of give you really a lot of autonomy and do all of these interesting kinds of work that you wouldn't get to do, you know, if you were just starting out in your career because you have to kind of like start at the bottom of the totem pole. And this was kind of a way to like not even be on the ladder. You were kind of like off here somewhere above where you might be and getting to be advised directly by some really senior people in these really awesome institutions. And so the fellowship since, since it was founded in the 1970s, I believe, or maybe the 1980s, um, has expanded the topics that it focuses on. So it was nuclear, then it was all weapons of mass destruction, then it was like peace and security um, and on the topic of peace building. And then the most recent expansion was emerging technology. And, you know, I kind of saw what I was doing as, you know, yes, a lot of biosecurity is preventing like biological weapons, which fall under like the category of weapons of mass destruction. But really what we're trying to do is figure out how this emerging technology and synthetic synthetic biology can really like coexist in this world and, and, and not be a security threat. And we can reap all the benefits of synthetic biology without any of the, you know, downsides. So I come down to DC February 3rd, 2020, and I am in DC for, I'm, I'm at my job for like two weeks and I get, you know, one someone from the communications department at Carnegie comes like up to my cubicle and is like, hey, so you're one of the only people in this building with the biology background and we hear that there's this thing happening, you know, with COVID, I think it was in Italy at the time. And, you know, that was what was consuming the news cycle. And they were like, you think you can like write us a piece about COVID? And I was like, sure. Like, I, you know, I don't really know anything about infectious diseases per se, but I'm like happy to take a look. And so I spent the like, you know, last two weeks of February going deep into like all of the sources. And so, you know, even though a lot of people in, in the US, it didn't really become reality for them until like middle of March by like, by like the end of February, I was like, this is crazy. Like something big and bad. And I kept telling everybody at the office, I was like, this is, this is like, this is big. Like, don't, don't ignore it. Um, and I remember, so I, I published my piece on like March 3rd and it was all about how we could use technology to help fight ep epidemics and help fight infectious disease and looking at some early examples coming out of places like Italy and like China about how they were using technology to address the pandemic. Um, but, you know, I, at the time, I was, like, trying to, to say something new and different about what was happening. And now, I mean, a million people have written that article subsequently. Um, but it was really interesting at the time. And then on, like, March 15th, when they told us the offices were going to be closed until, like, April 30th, I was like, oh, no. They're going to be closed for much longer. So I packed up my entire desk, and I told my colleagues, I'm like, I'm finishing this job at the end of July, so I will never see you again. But it was nice to get to meet you. And they were like, what are you talking about? We're going to be back here in a month. And uh, nowadays you are working with, uh, as a data scientist, right? Or I don't know how you describe what you are doing nowadays. And I do know that you can't talk a lot about that. But uh, what, what are you doing, like, generally, an overview? So the company that I'm working for, it's called Talus Analytics. And what they do is they're a data consulting company. So they work with different partners and help them, you know, analyze their data and visualize their data in such a way that it's actually usable. And they work mainly with clients that are in the public policy space, really, but really the public health space. So like the CDC. Um, and I've gotten to work on some really interesting kind of projects, a lot of things that have to do with, with COVID and, and, and vaccinations and a lot of kind of more on like the public health angle, but really getting to use my computer science um, 
knowledge, use all the policy background and context that I learned at my fellowship and really bring them together to answer some really crucial problems that are that we're facing right now. And that's awesome uh, because you, you told us a lot about many different experiences on biology, on computer science, on policy, and it seems that you are combining all of them. And I, I know that this is also something that you are doing on your current project with um, the iGEM Foundation. So what are you doing on iGEM? It's called Project Phoenix. And the idea behind it is that in iGEM, we are so good at design, build, test, but oftentimes we miss out on that iterate step because, you know, an iGEM project's only, you know, nine months long, not all of them get picked up afterwards. Um, and we build these incredible prototypes that sometimes get lost. And so the idea behind Project Phoenix is to bring together iGEM's data and all of the different things that we know about teams and their projects and where they left off and what still needs to be done and put it in a way that's really easily searchable um, for other iGEM teams or just people who are looking, you know, for research kind of ideas and projects, you know, someone could pick it up for an iGEM team, someone could pick it up for their master's thesis, right? Like these are incredible proof of concepts that we have, but we just need a way to make that whole data set more searchable and more approachable and tagged better. When you, you look back to all those experiences from Ronnie Zinha, <laughs> little Ronnie, growing up in and uh, doing a bunch of uh, bio stuff, to go to getting a degree on computer science, to go into Switzerland talking uh, with delegates and uh, like looking to what you are doing nowadays, working with policy, data, biology, and doing a bunch of cool projects. When you look back to your entire journey, um, what do you think? How, how has this experience of revisiting your story? Um, are you happy with where you are nowadays? This is always a tricky question because really I, I do, you know, see my journey as a series of like, you know, being in the right place at the right time and having a tremendous amount of, of luck and also like just so much opportunity that's been available to me to kind of bring all these things together. Like it's not necessarily so obvious that all of my different interests could combine in all of these interesting ways. It's really just been about, you know, one of the things that I try to do whenever, you know, a, it presented with the opportunity to have a new kind of job or experience or fellowship. I'm looking forward to, to hear more about the Phoenix project, what you will achieve. And th this is very, a very powerful idea, an idea that has been circulating around our community for a long time. As you said, a lot of people work it and because it's a very interesting concept. So let's see, let's see what comes next. Maybe you can come back in a year and talk or in two years and talk about the amazing stuff that you did in meanwhile. But anyway, for now, Thank you very much for sharing your story. It was awesome. It's a, it was a pleasure to meet you uh, and to share some pieces of this story with you. And yeah, good luck with all the amazing projects. Thank you so much for joining. Yeah, thanks so much for having me. This is, this is really fun. That was an outstanding conversation. I hope you enjoyed as much as I did. See you soon on our, on our next episode. I will interview Danan Jan and talk about corn, mentorship, and the future of humankind. Stay tuned!